described already. And there you can have all of the meetings uh, being uh, uh, stored there. So you can uh, watch again, or you can share with your colleagues and in your, if you, in, with your team, if you feel like this session or any other session are worth for them uh, watching. So you can share the link uh, on YouTube. And this session has been broadcast, is going to be broadcast on YouTube live uh, as well. So we have a few announcements to all of you. So uh, what we have been uh, organizing for you. We are very happy to be a partner of the Fetal Heart Society. They are going to have their meeting on November the 4th. So please uh, register uh, for that. I'm sure this is going to be nice. On November uh, the 12th, Dr. Anderson with Dr. Diane Spicer and Dr. Adrian, they are going to continue with the amazing morphology uh, series. We are going to talk about the development of the outflow tracts. It's a very interactive uh, a session, so please uh, join us because I'm sure you're going to learn a lot. Uh, for the surgeons in the house, we have this very nice uh, 3D uh, hands-on training. Uh, the, it, this is organized with our colleagues from Toronto, and we are very happy to be partner of them. So if you're a surgeon and you want to uh, uh, learn more and train your skills in a, a very nice, in a 3D uh, print uh, model, uh, join uh, these activities, very nice. And uh, we are every Saturday uh, placing online one episode of this series that is very interesting. So this is about the history of the pediatric cardiology. Every week we uh, uh, talk about the history of one procedure. So all of them are on the YouTube channel already. So you just can uh, go there and check it out. And uh, I'm very, very happy to announce that. Uh, we are going to have a journal club in memory of Dr. Gary Webb that unfortunately passed away uh, this last week. And uh, in uh, association with SHIP, that's the network that he made since uh, 2014. And uh, we are going, we want to continue with uh, his legacy. And uh, so in a so congenital heart academy in association with CHIP, we are going to have every month uh, one journal club. Um, and we really want all of you to participate. We have uh, uh, here the email address of Congenital Heart Academy. If you feel like, first of all, presenting one of them. So we want to make this very interactive. This is especially for uh, the trainees and the junior staff. If you want to present one paper, uh, please uh, send us an email. If you want to suggest one paper that you like to have in our journal club to discuss further, so please as well uh, text us or uh, email us. We'll be very happy with uh, to, to see your collaboration and uh, to uh, choose uh, the paper that maybe you suggested. So the idea of this journal club is that you have a junior staff or a trainee uh, to present the paper and have a chat with one of the authors or more than one of the authors uh, uh, to solve the, the doubts of everybody to discuss further and to call some specialists in the area uh, as well. So to discuss further the topic. So that's the idea. It's going to be once a month. The first one we are preparing for November 23rd. So I hope all of you can join and please join us in this interactive way. We want all of you to participate. And now with you, uh, Dr. Rima Bader, uh, she is the coordinator of this uh, amazing series about fetal cardiology. And today we have three outstanding speakers. I'm sure this is going to be awesome. Please type your questions on the Q&A chat box so we can discuss in the end of the meeting uh, about this topic. Rima, it's with you. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you, Grace, um, and um, we're so grateful to Congenital Heart Academy to uh, sort of host these uh, important uh, fetal webinars. I'm Rima Bader, Professor of Pediatric Cardiology and the organizer of the, these episodes. Today we have uh, uh, great speakers from, uh, um, from UCS, uh, from, uh, from a very well-known uh, center, and um, we're going to present uh, three levels of talks, uh, basic, intermediate, and advanced, and I'm very privileged to start the first talk with Emilio and uh, um, have a little short biography. Of course, he's a staff of UCSF and uh, he's assistant professor. He got his medical degree from Fra uh, Francisco uh, Maureen University in Guatemala City. And then he done further postgraduate training in Portland, Oregon. And uh, he's currently part of the staff at UCSF. And he's going to talk to us about fetal ventricular function and rhythm basic tools. Thank you. 
Emilio, please proceed. Thank you so much. And thank you for the invitation. I'm very excited to be participating in an international venue. Um, it's wonderful to have this opportunity to make pediatric cardiology teaching international. I will share my screen now. So today I will be reviewing uh, basic tools available for the assessment of fetal ventricular function and rhythm. I have nothing to disclose. By the end of this talk, I am hoping that you will be able to define fetal ventricular function and understand its components. You know the techniques for function that are available and a basic routine assessment of the fetal rhythm. I will be follow this agenda and I'm gonna to try to go fast to try to cover most of it. We will be starting with the definition of ventricular function. Ventricular function is the intrinsic ability of the myocardium to maintain cardiac output. Um, this has to be in a sustained fascial fashion and it has to be adaptable to physiologic changes. Due to the risk of this function, Available management options and end goal uh, with an end goal of optimization of outcomes, uh, we are able to assess a function. We need to assess function, pardon. If you see here, apart from the determination of fractional shortening and ejection fraction with M mode and 2D grayscale, uh, most of the quant quantitative techniques of ventricular function in the fetus is with the use of pulse and continuous dopplers. I'll talk briefly about the myocardial performance index as an assessment of both systolic and diastolic function. Today, I'll discuss specific techniques, techniques of systolic and diastolic and combined function. This publication is actually a wonderful resource uh, in daily clinical practice. Um, it provides uh, multiple parameters that are typically measured during a fetal echo, and it has a very nice summary. So we'll move and we'll start with systolic function, starting with the very basic cardiothoracic area ratio. The CTA ratio is key in the assessment, the initial assessment of ventricular dysfunction. Typically, we use the area method at UCSF, and the normal values are shown here. But there's also use of circumference, and um, the normal value is also listed here. CTA ratio is especially useful in cases of high output and can be very useful in determining the patient's risk. In particular, uh, the uh, noticing right atrial dilation and tricuspid valve regurgitation may be a key feature in determining the uh, risk level of the patients. As you can see in this example here, I'm showing cardiomegaly. In most routine uh, fetal echocardiograms, I say we use the um, eyeball method or in Spanish, the el ojimetro, assessing a uh, Quali qualitatively the function of the ventricles. Typically when we have normal function, this is uh, a very trustworthy method as it is when it's a um, very a poor function. When we're in the middle is when we need to start using quantitative methods. And I'll talk about that now. Fractional shortening is the first one that I'll speak. This is obtained by the use of motion or M mode and it can be calculated with the formula um, presented there. It's very important to know that the direction of the M mode line has to be perpendicular to the ventricular septum, and it always has to be in an adequate four chamber view. Here we see measurement of fractional shortening in both the left and the right ventricles. Normal values in human fetuses were determined incredibly almost three decades ago. And most recently published in JACE, there's a wonderful publication that reported C-score equations for 57 functional measurements 
uh, are available. Of course, a fractional shortening is one of them. Typically, the normal fractional shortening is 34%. Recent advances in calculating fractional shortening include a method of automated two-dimensional tracking. The machine will measure the fractional shortening actively. And a multi-segmental fractional shortening calculation was described. Here they measured 24 segments at the same time, both in systole and diastole, and reported normal values for each of those segments. The limitations of fractional shortening are the fetal lie or fetal position. Um, as always, the very challenging maternal body habitus or uh, the endemic of obesity here makes imaging really uh, challenging. And uh, we have to remember that this is a two-dimensional measure in a very complex three-dimensional structure with very different geometrical um, characteristics. Moving on to ejection fraction, this is the percentage of blood ejected from a ventricle in each cardiac cycle. It is calculated with, uh, that, with the use of diastolic and systolic volumes. It is obtained uh, typically by a biplane Simpsons method. Uh, the most easy and simple one is the monoplane, which is obtained from an appropriately taken four chamber view. This is quick and simple, but the more reliable and exact is the biplane symptoms method using both the four chamber and the two chamber view. Of course, given that it's more uh, precise, it should be the preferred method. This is a very simple cartoon for visual learners showing again the formula for ejection fraction. And in the literature, you can find normal values uh, published. The mean left and right ventricular ejection fraction remain constant with advancing pregnancy, as you can see in the graph. And uh, both the mean left and right are about 0.45 or 45%. Briefly mentioning alternative methods, a, a, I'm not gonna go into detail here, but they are more complex methods based on different geometrical formulas not typically used in fetal echo given their complexity. Finally, talking about limitations, uh, again, uh, we have to have a correct angle of insonation to get a nice ejection fraction. We have to consider the geometrical differences of both ventricles, one being a ellipsoid and the other one being crescent shape. Um, the, uh, oh, we're talking about maternal water habitus or inappropriate image quality important to consider dyssynchrony or arrhythmias as limitations of calculation of rejection fraction. So moving on to longitudinal function assessment, this is done in, with a MAPSI, TAPSI, or a SAPSI, which stands for septal annular plane systolic excursion. As we know, a fractional shortening and ejection fraction reflect a global radial systolic function and typically are usually altered only in late stages of a cardiac dysfunction. TAPC and MAPC are measured using anatomical MO tracings, and the parameters may be affected earlier than fractional shortening and ejection fraction. Um, we all know that this is widely used in adults and children, but this is a significantly less used in fetal. I would say when we use it, we use the middle one, TAPSI. Reference ranges have been published and they are available from a 20 to 37 weeks gestation in low risk pregnancies. This was a publication done in Brazil. Briefly, um, we can see that Mean values for TAPSI have been uh, reported to be higher than MAPSI. They are useful and found to be reduced in fetal growth restriction and twin, to twin transfusion syndrome. Interestingly, I found that there is a significant difference found in isolated single umbilical artery. And it, it, they, they conclude that it's a really good complementary tool in the detection of hyperdynamic states. Um, here, I just mentioned that MAPSI is again rarely used. 
Moving on to the A index, a more sophisticated method of a measuring a ventricular function. The Tay index or myocardial performance index was described by Tay and his colleagues in 1995. Now, um, it is a simple and reproducible method that assesses global and com of global measurement of combined performance. This is important to know that uh, uh, different to the prior ones that I spoke about, it reflects both systolic and diastolic elements of, per of ventricular performance. It is another early consistent marker and it can be obtained by Doppler methods. We all know and love our pressure volume curves. And I just want to mention that the index, the myocardial performance index uses both isovolumic or isovolumetric in relaxation and contraction times and the ejection time to calculate the formula. So from a four chamber plane, a spectral Doppler is obtained in the area below the mitral valve, typically in the inflow outflow view. In, on the right, we can see a, a newer technology in which we use dual gate Doppler methods. You can see the two gates here. A, and two regions of interest are placed at the right inflow and right outflow tracks respectively. And a, you can get all the times simultaneously calculated and in an event in an identical cardiac cycle. Again, normal values are published and available in the literature. This is one of those that literally there's a plethora of articles reporting normal values for MPI. This is a wonderful meta-analysis that I'm presenting uh, done by Gawi, and it summarizes most of the normal values uh, in, of larger articles, as you can see here. The authors reported normal values shown on the left side of your screen. They showed normal values of MPI in multiple different diagnoses, and they performed correlations of, of the myocardial performance index in both to both gestational age and heart rate. So in conclusion, the uh, biventricular MPI appear to be independent of gestational age, as we can see in the graph in the middle. This uh, index can be used as a screening and follow-up tool for global cardiac function assessment, in, typically in high output states and or complex congenital heart disease. Since its introduction in 1995, it has had quite, quite a few advances. And uh, you can see here that in 2005, in 10 years later, the modified MPI was introduced. The modified MPI is the same, but utilizing the valve clicks as measuring landmarks. This reduced significantly the inter and intra server variability on measurements. And um, as I mentioned before, the future seems to be automation. So we will move forward on discussing this diastolic function. I'll start with one of the measurements of time. It's the isovolumetric relaxation time or IVRT. Typically this is done on the left ventricle and corresponds to the initial period of diastole. This measurement can be obtained again through pulse Doppler and tissue Doppler. The basic idea here is the measurement so this measurement is to record the time between closing of semilunar valves and opening of the atrioventricular valves. And diastolic function may be, a, sorry, diastolic dysfunction may be present when the IVRT is abnormally high, typically greater than 50. Moving on to inflows, we can use a four chamber view as depicted here in the picture. In, and then sample the volume with pulse wave Doppler with color. In the normal blood flow into the ventricle consists of a biphasic waveform in, the, in which the initial waveform coincides with the E wave, which is the passive or early feeling of the ventricle. And the late flow coincides with the A wave, the phase of atrial systole or the atrial kick. 
Uh, given that we have lower ventricular compliance in the fetal heart, the magnitude of the A uh, wave normally exceeds that of the E wave. And typically at 16 weeks, it's, we're gonna have a ratio of greater than one. It is important to understand that with advancing gestational age, the E wave, as you can notice here in the lower picture, increases and will reach A. Here you can see abnormal patterns in AV valve inflow. Most commonly, we see a monophasic pattern or fusion of the E and wave, which indicates, that, indicates diastolic dysfunction. A, more rarely, you can see a inversion of this when the EA ratio is a high, and this is typically due to a preload impairment. The interesting thing is that it's volume loading with preload impairment without a diastolic dysfunction. Moving forward, moving back on fetus, we go out of the heart and we, we can pulse with Doppler, the inferior vena cava. Doppler of the IVC a, a findings have been similar a, in adults and children with this typical triphasic pattern of a systolic wave followed by a diastolic wave and an A wave that is it has reversal of flow with atrial contraction. The indices that we use are listed here. Abnormal Doppler profiles include a, a wave reversal typically greater than 0.2 meters per second. It, this will again indicate diastolic dysfunction and the crease S wave will be suggestive of tricuspid valve regurgitation. Moving slightly more distally in the fetus, we next interrogate the ductus venosus and a normal Doppler pattern is shown here. In the ductus venosus, any A wave to the baseline or reversal is abnormal and will indicate increased atrial filling pressures. Finally, moving further distally uh, from the heart, we go to the umbilical vein. Here we see a normal pattern. Uh, please focus on the lower aspect of the graph here. We see a, a laminar continuous flow of low velocity. Abnormal will show initially notching at end diastole and very abnormal findings include venous pulse, pulsations or pulsatility as we can see here. Of course, as we progress from normal to abnormal, this is an indication of increasing central venous pressure. So there we finished both systolic and diastolic functions. And now I'm gonna speak about combined outputs. Output is defined as the amount of blood ejected by the ventricle indexed by minute. This can be calculated with the formula shown here and uh, its factors include stroke volume and heart rate. And as I mentioned before, before stroke volume, it has different methods of, of, uh, to be calculated. In, in order to calculate stroke volume, you will need the velocity time integral or known as VTA and the cross-sectional cross area of the chosen valve. This is going to be through semilunar valves as you can see here, the formula for CSA includes the diameter, which is what we will measure. So in practice, what it's, the cross-sectional area is calculated by measurement of the respective semilunar valve diameter and applying the, the formula showed here. You calculate the velocity time integral of the pulse Doppler, and then you can apply the formula. In this important publication from also two decades ago, the combined cardiac output um, references were published and they gave us all the ranges uh, throughout gestational age, starting from 13 weeks. As was described by Dr. Rudolph, this has remained constant. Uh, there's uh, always the 60% right heart dominance of cardiac outputs. 
This is a spreadsheet that we use at UCSF to uh, serially graph the combined cardiac outputs and monitor progression uh, through pregnancy. Normal combined cardiac outputs are reported to be in, in, are reported in milliliters per minute, and one has to index it. And the normal value is approximately 500 to 550 milliliters per a, a kilogram per minute. Typically, the compensation will occur when the combined the, the combined ventricular outflow doubles that of normal. I had the pleasure in doing my pediatric training to work with Dr. James Huta, who in 2005 published this wonderful paper uh, showing a method that combined multivariate uh, factors, uh, including five parameters to describe the um, risk of patients with high drops in fetal life. Um, this. Uh, is known as the a cardiovascular profile score, and it predicts the severity of fetal outcome. Here's the cardiovascular profile score with all of its factors that include high drops, the venous Doppler parameters, heart size, cardiac function, and arterial Doppler. A normal score is 10, and you give two points per parameter. In the lower the score, the worse the prognosis. And this has been thoroughly validated. Here, a study of 102 hydropic fetuses were included, and 40 of those, they, they had comparisons of first and last evaluations. We see here that of the 100 patients that had a mean cardiovascular profile score of about 5.5 died, and they, they were lower and statistically significant to those that remained alive. In the 40 patients that had comparison with a change in mean a profile, a cardiovascular profile score of about two, 60% died. So it's again, quite validated, very useful in, in, in the assessment of function in fetal high drops. And they concluded that the best predictor is venous Doppler. So again, assessment of diastolic function, a grade of cardiomegaly, and one, that, one thing that I won't mention is the addition of arterial Doppler in, in the measurement that tends to be affected late. Briefly, I just want to show basic images on how to perform a routine rhythm assessment utilizing the techniques shown here. Here are the normal parameters for heart rates. And it's important to know that approximately 2% of all pregnancies will have some form of rhythm disturbance. The good thing is that the vast majority are benign, but they should all have a structural echocardiogram. We can measure rhythm or assess rhythm based on the atrioventricular relationships. This is what's known as the rhythm strip approach. I am showing an image here of tissue Doppler in which you can measure the different parameters here showing the PR interval. Again, a, using the same inflow Doppler, inflow outflow Doppler, one can assess AV intervals and its relationships. Important in rhythm to make sure and check that it's an organized pattern with the, the E and A followed by S, a order that I mentioned before. This correlates with, again, PR intervals, and a, one can determine the, the sinus a, quality of the rhythm. Another one for rhythm assessment is the superior vena cava to aortic Doppler. You can see here in the first image that one places the ultrasound gate in between the aorta and the superior vena cava. Typically, this is done with color Doppler. And a pattern of a Doppler profile file is shown and one can uh, estimate again uh, the PR interval. Here again, tissue Doppler, we can see that the different um, waves of tissue Doppler correlate with our electrocardiogram and our wonderful determinants of normal rhythm. Lastly, the use of M mode, very important in, in rhythm assessment, again, because we can 
pass a line of ultrasound passing through the atrial wall, through the central crux of the heart and the ventricular wall, and then use the M mode strip and try to correlate those uh, different beats. I'm not gonna go into detail, but one can get very specific and determine even if the BA or AV interval are of different durations and differentiate the different types of arrhythmias. And with that, I am a little bit over my time. And I just wanna say thank you to my co-presenters today for their mentorship and the slides and my public appreciation to Mr. Dan Dwyer, a sonographer that created the website Parameter C. If you haven't, this is a wonderful resource for a clinical practice in fetal echo. And I open for questions. Thank you so much. Uh, so beautiful, uh, so focused, and uh, it's not really very basic, but um, I, we opened the floor for discussion. First, we'd like to uh, uh, welcome our mentor and, uh, and master, Dr. Silverman. He's back from holidays. We missed you in the ninth webinar, and uh, now um, uh, we're open for discussion. Do you have any okay. questions? I have lots of questions, but I'm not going to start. Well, you, you should ask questions because I think that talk was absolutely amazing, Emilio. I'm only sorry you, you never quoted any of my research on it, but my, perhaps it was too early for you. I am but, sorry, uh, Norm, there is so much. <laughs> the, uh, the, I have no questions. I think it was a magnificent talk. It was beautifully organized and beautifully presented. There's nothing more that I can say about it. Thank you. So uh, uh, why don't you go ahead, Rima, because... Uh, you uh, probably have some other questions you want to ask about. Yes, I'd like to ask you, Amelia, uh, because, you know, we and, and these webinars, we try to address the basics in intermediate for the basics. How do you do your M mode? Because are you, you, you before we go to the spectral, now the M mode, you want it to be how? And where do you put, uh, not for rhythm, for, uh, for ejection fraction, where do you put your, your, your uh, plane and sector? And just in how would you, adjust the uh, image quality and, uh, and you know, to be able to see it clearly, because that's a question that people find it difficult to do proper M modes. Absolutely. I think the key here in M mode is having a, so, so to your first question, Rima, we have to get M modes, there are two options, and a four chamber view and in short axis. Most of the data has been reported on four axis, but the important here and the technical aspect of it is that you have to have a very appropriate short axis because if you are for shortening, you're going to fastly change your fractional shortening. So your M mode line has to be typically a nice big image with an M mode line going perpendicular to the ventricular. Could you go back sector. to one of your images, Emilia, because you've shown that beautifully. Yes, absolutely. Um, and let me just bring the talk here. Let me find that. Right here, I have two pictures. So this is again the, sorry, I'm getting lost. Again, this is a very nice picture. We have the, the thoracic circumference, the cardiac circumference, and we have a beautiful four chamber view here. So key is to having this four chamber view. And you want to be as perpendicular as possible to the, the interventricular septum and measure slightly below the atrioventricular plane, kind of like in the middle of the ventricular septum. And you should be able to get an M mode pattern like this. And then one proceeds to measure the different uh, systolic and diastolic portions. So, and so cl clearly you wanted to, to have, uh, first of all, a proper position. Number two, clarity of the edges uh, of, the, of the septum and the walls, right? Because this is what you're going to read and measure. Correct. And then you play with the filter a little bit, or you won't play with the filter to see the edges. It, it, typically, you can increase your gains and make the tissue a little bit echo lucid. So making, again, your measurement a little bit easier. Um, also, that one thing that I didn't show is if you have a nice images, you can do a short axis where you find similar to transthoracic echo in postnatal life. You can find the two papillary muscles and measure there. Great, thank I am you. unaware if uh, numbers are reported, but I'm sure Norm knows. For uh, for uh, for the sure. walls? Oh, I'm not sure of that. 
And for the spectral Doppler, could you go back? You showed also beautiful uh, the E and E and S waves, and you showed the corresponding uh, ECG to that. Absolutely. Let me see. I don't know if you mean this one. Uh, yes, please. Could you talk a little bit about that, the ECG and the correlation? Because we, we don't have ECG. We, we depend on that, on a, as Dr. Hutter taught me. This is a full ECG. Yes. And so if you kindly you, showed that. Yeah. yeah. So briefly, do you see here, Rima, this is tissue doppler. You can also do this with the pulse doppler. But you see here that this is the E prime in tissue doppler or the E in normal doppler pulsed, the A wave and the S wave, right? And the cycle repeats itself. So if you uh, would imagine that the, your normal EKG from the beginning of the A wave or, or the atrial kick to the beginning of the S wave, you have the PR interval. This is going to be your S wave is going to represent your ventricular contraction or the QRS complex and the repolarization. And then the cardiac cycle repeats itself. So imagining also the I don't have it here, but imagining that with one second, sorry. Putting the um, pressure volume loops on top of that, you can see here that you have the interventricular contraction time prior to systolic ejection and relaxation time prior to diastole. So, so you use this just for the PR, or you use it for uh, for complex tachycardia as well? For what? Sorry. For ratio. What? So you you use the spectral Doppler just to measure the the, the PR interval yeah. in cases of early heart block, or for also complex tachycardias. Hey, typically, you, you can use them for both. We we routinely use this for assessment of a heart block in risk of heart block in SSA, SSB positive antibodies. And we measure the PR interval from here to here. But again, this is a good assessment for different tachycardias because it gives you the organized pattern of E, A, and S. So, so AV and VA ratios. Yeah. Yes. AV and and where, where, where do you put your, and um, this is a lateral, this is below the valve. Where are you, where are you sampling here? A, is so it you're a you're sampling a similar to a TAPSI or a MAPSI. You're doing mm -hmm. a tissue doppler of the, the annular plane of the tricuspid valve. This is a four chamber view, and this is at the, at the lateral wall of, yeah, the, right. of the ventricle. Yeah, right here, Sima, you see a, here is inflow outflow, and TAPSI, you're at the lateral wall, and you can do it on the mitral, the septum, or the tricuspid. Oh, this is not TAPSI. This is not TAPSI. This is MPI, but you are we talking how to yes, do this? Yes, I'm just showing. I'm just showing. Sorry, that is confusing. Yeah, I'm just showing how you get the tissue doppler. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like, and you also showed a, a beautiful septal. Um, um, this is this is beautiful. We have a question here uh, mm -hmm. from the audience. Actually, we have two questions. How do you use ICT and IRT measured by different modalities? Tissue doppler, LV inflow, and dual gate doppler normal value is quite different. I'm not sure he's trying to say different machines or different values here. You use ICT. It's a different modality. So it could be like a pulse Doppler and, and, tissue, and, and tissue Doppler and, you know. Yeah, so the two modalities would be pulse. And you would Doppler. get Doppler, the one you were talking about, about the, uh, the outflow tract? Yes, the inflow outflow. Yeah. No, no, the, the outflow track that you showed, the short axis. You showed the short axis? Oh, sorry. Yes, you mean the dual yeah. gate? Yeah, that's he's asking about dual gate, yeah. Yeah, the dual gate is just newer technology on the machines that allow you to have two pulse waves at the same time and in the same cardiac cycle. So it's really neat to play with it because you pulse an inflow and then you have another gate that pulses an outflow and you get the same thing only with two lines. So is the question is that, do you go by numbers or do you go by trend? I think this is what he's trying to say in the question here. Different modalities and, and, and do you have, we'll have different numbers. I don't know. Yeah, I think uh, numbers, I would say. Anita, any, any, any input here? Um, I, I think they're asking how do you uh, account for the fact that 
normal values are quite different. Uh, of course, tissue Doppler and blood pool Doppler are looking at different things. And so the normal values there are different. I, and I, I think that the most important is to be consistent. Um, as Emilio said, in our, in our lab, we routinely uh, use at least two uh, methods for rhythm assessment in all of the SSA fetuses. And this uh, helps us when we're assessing rhythm abnormalities or function abnormalities because our sonographers are just very used to um, to doing all of these measurements. And you can either have normal values uh, within your own lab or you can refer to the normal value tables that he presented. But one of course must uh, make sure that they are comparing um, uh, tissue Doppler normals to a tissue Doppler that you obtained in your lab. They're not mix and match. You, you have to, uh, to use the correct references and be consistent. I think he's trying to say that with the new modalities, with the strain and strain rate, it's, it's sort of machine dependent, right? But here we're not talking about machines, we're talking about values and numbers in that you have to, do we have reference numbers? I think we do have some reference numbers that we can go to, right? It's not, it's not different from uh, Volisone to, to Philips, whatever. This is a different issue than the, the strain and, and strain rate. But, but what are the two things that you uh, ask the, your um, group uh, to use uh, in, in, in rhythm assessment? What are your standard things that you do? Anita, in the lab. Inflow yes, out. We do Doppler. at least two modalities, yeah. Yeah, inflow out flow Doppler and tricuspid valve uh, lateral annulus tissue Doppler. So tissue okay. Doppler and so tissue Doppler for the right ventricle and inflow out flow Doppler for the left the ventricle. MPI. Okay. All right, great. And, Thank you so uh, much. SVC, SVC aorta Doppler if, uh, if there's a rhythm abnormality suspected. Okay, another question. How useful is LV ejection fraction RV uh, fractional air, area uh, shortening when you have significant MR or TR? So indirectly, what is, how do you assess MR and TR? Emilio, please, if you could um, uh, tackle this. So what do you use to, to assess MR and TR? What are your best um, techniques in, to, to assess that in a fetus, so regardless the of the station? Yeah, so the best technique to, to assess MR and TR is going to be your basic four chamber view where you're gonna show the, the location of the regurgitation and the, the amount so you can uh, put a grade to it. In, on how useful it is to, how useful it is to, for ejection fraction when you have significant MR and TR, I do not know the answer to that. Honestly, I haven't read that if, if you have moderate to severe MR, if it affects your ejection fraction. Um, I don't know if Shab or Anita have experience on this. I would assume I it definitely this... changes because they're volume loading, but exactly. I don't know how it affects it. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. If there's, um, there's some of the problems with these measurements, although quantitative, they can be influenced by um, other hemodynamic issues like regurgitation and, and causing a volume load on the ventricle can alter your um, measurements for ejection fraction. So you have to, so in, in those situations, it's really, um, uh, you know, looking at kind of trends over time, I would say, um, rather than the actual measurement because they can be um, influenced. They're load dependent, basically, those measurements. I think we're, um, you know, we're used to in in our pediatric patients saying that significant regurgitation affects your ejection fraction, and it's not a, as uh, as reliable that a normal ejection fraction may not be normal in a patient with severe aortic insufficiency, for instance. I think it's harder in the fetus because uh, of this issue of blood flow redistribution to the to the other ventricle. And so the, you, you can't know exactly what the volumes are. Um, I would just say that if there's significant regurgitation that, uh, that you do have to go to other methods of, um, of assessing function and that ejection fraction is probably not, uh, not the correct one to use as it may be falsely reassuring. The other thing about regurgitation, significant volume load on the ventricle, even if there's diastolic dysfunction, you may get normalization of the inflow Dopplers, the ENA, 
And so that's uh, that's something that, uh, again, Rima said, we're still in the basic uh, portion <laughs> of the lectures, but um, but definitely a significantly volume loaded uh, ventricle will have a pseudo normal inflow uh, Doppler pattern. Would you do TAPSI in, in, in TR and stuff like that? Or uh, Anita, would you go for TAPSI? You know, I haven't, we haven't used TAPSI that, that much. And so um, I, I'd be interested to hear and maybe any audience uh, experience with that. And as far as using tricuspid regurgitation, um, I think Shab's gonna talk a little bit more uh, about, uh, about use, using regurgitation for functional assessments. But, um, uh, you know, the DPDT uh, is, in the small fetus has a huge amount of uh, inter and intra observer variability. And uh, as far as I know, uh, people haven't really been using uh, the regurgitation for that purpose. Um, Norman, Dr. Silverman, fraction area shortening. What do you think of that in assessment? It's also part of the question in, in assessment of regurgitation jets. Yeah, unmute, Thank unmute. I think it's just another indices, one of the indices that you can use. I mean, uh, we, uh, we're not really fabulous about uh, getting functions. So we have to use uh, all of the, uh, the tools that are uh, at our disposal. And uh, fractional area change is one of them. I would uh, just um, augment fractional area change with uh, what Anita had shown us because we know, uh, for example, in adults, where you look at the patients with mitral insufficiency that have reasonably good ejection fractions and you take them to surgery and you get rid of the mitral insufficiency and their function goes down because basically it's the afterload that um, is uh, creating the problem. And... Um, once you um, increase the afterload, the ventricle, the muscle function sort of comes into its true reflection. So I think that the same is true of volume as it is for fractional area change. I, I believe you don't believe in it, right? I don't, no, I don't say that I don't believe in it, but I, I think that you've got to be careful about making a sole assessment on function based on one or another index. I think um, one you. thing I just want to add, <clears throat> I think I agree with Norman. Um, at the end of the day, I mean, these measurements are, are really important, but we have to take all of the measurements into account when we're making an overall assessment of function, including our qualitative assessment of function, which is really clinically what we depend on the most um, in, in clinical practices. We're really using our qualitative assessment of function, taking into account how much regurgitation there is um, and also taking into account some of these measurements, but it's really a combined, uh, like sort of a composite way of assessing function overall based on all the information at hand. And maybe here the, um, the score comes in, Dr. Yeah. Luta's score comes in as a, a, with the positives and negatives. It's a language that people can talk about and can sort of uh, over the phone, the score below seven, oh, oh, that's bad, above seven is not very, is okay perhaps. Thank that you so much. Good. Now, sorry. Yes, no, no. Emilio. Sorry, you want to say something? That was the goal. And I just wanted to say, that, like, repeating what uh, Shav said, I think all of the composite, but serial assessment is the key, right? You're going to base the change in your patient in future studies. Dow, it's a great pleasure to present our next speaker. And the title is Twin Twin Transfusion Cardiovascular mm -hmm. Assessment. Um, Shab is not new for the Congenital Heart Academy. She's been a very close friend and supporter with um, Professor Moon Grady and her team. Uh, she's an associate professor of pediatrics at UCSF and associate director of fetal cardiovascular program at UCSF as well. And her research is targeted about cardiovascular physiology in, in congenital heart disease and influences of neurodevelopmental outcomes in children. Uh, most welcome, Chap. Please proceed with your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Rima, and thank you for having us uh, today. Um, so um, we're going to talk specifically about um, how we use some of the 
measurements that Emilio reviewed um, in a specific condition, uh, namely twin-twin transfusion syndrome, which is uh, a condition that we see a lot here at UCSF. Um, okay, um, so I'm gonna spend most of the time talking about cardiac manifestations of twin-twin transfusion syndrome and specifically the role of echocardiography in both pre-intervention and post-intervention assessment of uh, twins. And very briefly, some background uh, on twin pregnancies, which uh, comprise three to 5% of all pregnancies, a third are thought to be secondary to fertility treatments. And chorionicity is really important for risk stratification, which refers to whether the twins share a placenta or have their own individual placenta. And uh, monochorionic twinning is associated with many potential complications, one of which includes twin-twin transfusion syndrome. Uh, but the other important point is that monochorionic twins do have an increased risk of structural congenital heart disease. So at baseline, we do recommend that all monochorionic twins have a fetal echocardiogram to rule out structural heart disease, as well as um, assessing function um, for cases that may be progressing to twin-twin transfusion syndrome, as we'll review. Um, so twin-twin transfusion syndrome, um, the basic definition, uh, this is a very simplistic definition uh, that comprises 10 to 15% of monochorionic diamniotic twin pairs. And the illustration really shows here that one twin has oligohydramnios and the other twin has polyhydramnios. They uh, share a placenta with um, a sharing of vascular connections in that shared placenta, um, either through uh, arterial connections, arterial venous connections, or uh, venous venous connections. There is also some discordance in growth between the uh, two fetuses. And typically um, this condition presents at about 16 to 24 weeks gestation. So um, one of the ways that helped me really understand the pathophysiology of twin-twin transfusion is understanding normal placental vascular anatomy, um, which is um, described here in that in a normal pregnancy, there are these one-way channels for blood flow uh, where the umbilical artery dives into the placenta, gas exchange occurs, and that uh, paired vein returns back to the same fetus, essentially making a, sort of a U-turn. And in a twin pregnancy, what you want to see is that the normal paired artery vein has no connection to the other fetus sharing the same placenta. In monochorionic pregnancies where there's a shared placenta, there can be abnormal vascular connections in that shared placenta where the artery from one twin dives into the placenta and connects with a vein from the other twin. So instead of making a U-turn back to the same twin, we're seeing a, more of a one-way unidirectional uh, connection to the other twin. Interestingly, um, all monochorionic twins do have these unidirectional arteriovenous connections and transfuse one another. Most of the time, these, uh, there are an equal number of these one-way streets. So they, are, they sort of balance each other out and there's no net transfusion. Uh, to one fetus or the other. Um, but in certain situations that result in twin-twin transfusion syndrome, there's an imbalance in these one-way streets. So you uh, end up with a net transfusion from one twin to the other because of an unequal number of these one-way streets. And what this results in is twin-twin transfusion syndrome in which ultrasound is really the gold standard to diagnose this. And when you have this imbalance of AV connections, the donor twin as depicted here, experiences progressive hypovolemia, leading to decreased urine production, lack of visualization of the bladder and oligohydramnios. And in contrast, the recipient twin experiences an increase in volume load and is exposed to several vasoactive mediators that lead to the typical cardiac findings in the recipient twin, which I'll review uh, in a little bit. So traditionally we use uh, Quintero staging to diagnose and stage twin-twin transfusion syndrome. This is something that we use at our center here, which is helpful in terms of 
staging, but also determining candidacy for intervention. And Quintero staging, as many are familiar with uh, stage one, is uh, where there is oli and poly, oligo and one twin, polyhydramnios and the other twin, uh, but normal dopplers and normal bladders in both twins. Stage two is where you start to uh, not be able to visualize the bladder in the donor twin. And then stage three is where you start to see these critically abnormal Doppler patterns, mainly consisting of abnormalities in the umbilical artery in the donor, usually in the, um, by uh, decreased flow in diastole as seen here, or in severe cases, retrograde flow in diastole. And this is really in response to um, increased systemic vascular resistance or placental resistance in that donor twin that leads to this uh, change in the umbilical artery Doppler pattern. And similarly, with more progressive recipient twin cardiomyopathy, um, we start to see changes related to um, differences in loading patterns uh, in the heart, but also uh, filling uh, of the of specifically the right ventricle, um, where you start to see changes in the ductus venosus, for example, um, with decreased flow during atrial contraction or in severe cases, retrograde flow with atrial contraction. And then stage four is where you see high drops in the recipient twin. And then stage five is there is death of one twin. So the natural history of twin-twin transfusion, as I mentioned, typically presents at 16 to 24 weeks. If not treated, um, survival for advanced disease uh, is not great uh, at about 10 to 20%. And we have studies that have looked at the natural history of twin-twin if it's sort of left untreated during pregnancy. This is a study from NAFNET in 2016 that looked at 124 cases with stage one twin twin, so early, early stage twin twin, um, almost half of which um, underwent expectant management and did not have intervention uh, during the pregnancy. And over half of these cases progressed to more advanced stage twin twin. And the important part is that the mean number of days to progression was 11 days. So this um, really reflects the importance of close interval follow-up for monochorionic twin pregnancies, especially during this window of 16 to 24 weeks. I'm not gonna spend time talking too much about treatment options, but just to say that really in the current era, if it is technically feasible, the standard treatment for twin-twin transfusion syndrome in utero is selective laser photocoagulation, which basically, uh, disconnects the vascular connections in the shared placenta. And this is really one fetal intervention that has changed the natural history of this disease, which historically had a very high mortality rate um, or and significant morbidities. And with this intervention, we have seen uh, significant improvements in mortality. And as I'll talk about later in morbidities as well. So, what are the cardiac manifestations of twin-twin transfusion? As I mentioned, um, there is a high risk of structural congenital heart disease, uh, mostly due to acquired pulmonary stenosis, but a lot of um, these twins can also have congenital forms of um, structural heart disease as well. And the interesting part about this condition is that cardiac manifestations in the form of recipient twin cardiomyopathy appear even in early stages or sometimes even in pre-stage one twin-twin transfusion syndrome. And this is what recipient cardiomyopathy looks like. This is um, a fetus, a recipient twin who's on the more severe end of the spectrum just to, just to describe what the typical findings are. Um, but uh, typically what we see is uh, cardiomegaly. We see cardiac hypertrophy primarily in the right ventricle. Um, we, as I will show, um, we use a lot of the tools that Emilio described um, that demonstrates diastolic function pathology as the primary pathology that we see in recipient twin cardiomyopathy, and then um, progressive systolic dysfunction with more advanced disease. Um, and these findings are really thought to be due to an elevation in vasoactive mediators um, that sort of leads to this uh, hypertensive state and a, a hypertensive cardiomyopathy. 
Mediators such as endothelium one have been shown to be increased in invasive studies, as well as abnormal activation of the renin angiotensin system leading to this sort of hypertensive state in the recipient twin. And this ultimately can lead to uh, obstruction in the right ventricular outflow tract, either dynamic if there is significant hypertrophy or in some cases, valvar, valvar stenosis. This is an example of a, a recipient twin who um, developed acquired pulmonary valve dysplasia. And you can see here that the pulmonary valve looks dysplastic. If we were to measure this pulmonary valve, it is slightly smaller than it should be. And with color, we see that there is very little forward flow across the valve and there is pulmonary regurgitation. So um, as I mentioned, we evaluate function routinely in uh, monochorionic twin pregnancies, even when there is no uh, suspected twin-twin transfusion syndrome using a lot of the tools that Emilio described. Um, and that includes looking at markers of diastolic function using HAV valve inflow across the tricuspid and mitral valves, where with diastolic dysfunction and increased afterload to the ventricles, we start to see a monophasic pattern of inflow um, indicative of decreased filling times in that ventricle, as opposed to this uh, normal biphasic pattern that we see. We also use some of our other Doppler-derived measurements, including isovolumic relaxation time, um, which again um, is in the setting of recipient twin cardiomyopathy with diastolic dysfunction and shortened filling times, isovolumic relaxation time is prolonged in, in that setting, um, as well as the myocardial performance index, which we heard is really an index of global myocardial function, but can be abnormal in early stage twin twin um, because of shortened filling times, um, the, um, there is an increased time between the closure of the AV valve and then uh, opening of the AV valve, increasing the myocardial performance index number, indicating abnormal function. Um, so to sort of um, demonstrate how we come into play as fetal cardiologists in the assessment of monochorionic twin pregnancies, particularly if there's concern for twin-twin transfusion syndrome, I wanted to um, uh, demonstrate a case. This is actually one of the first cases I saw when I came on faculty at UCSF almost um, uh, eight years ago now. Um, and this is a, was a monochorionic twin pregnancy, first time mother who had no other risk factors, came to see us at, at 18 and four sevenths weeks. And at the time of this fetal echo, things looked really good. Um, there was no evidence of polyhydramnios or oligohydramnios in either, uh, oligohydramnios in either twin. Um, there was maybe slight growth discordance between the two twins, but nothing significant. And then our cardiac assessment demonstrated that uh, both twins had uh, normal systolic cardiac function, as you can see here qualitatively. There was no evidence of cardiomegaly um, or ventricular hypertrophy. And Doppler patterns uh, overall looked okay in the umbilical artery and umbilical vein, as well as in the ductus venosus. But we did see one abnormal finding across the tricuspid valve of twin A, which consisted of a fused or shortened inflow across the tricuspid valve. And as we learned, this is suggestive of um, uh, decreased filling time and suggestive of diastolic dysfunction of that ventricle. So this was a red flag to us and uh, prompted us to recommend closer interval follow-up. And about one week later, this mother returned and we can see that now, this is the image that I showed earlier, um, these twins progress to stage two twin-twin transfusion syndrome, where one twin had oligohydramnios um, and the donor twin was basically quite stuck. And then the other recipient twin had polyhydramnios. Our uh, cardiac findings were more obvious, um, where although systolic function was still preserved, we did see um, some evidence of mild right ventricular hypertrophy. Um, the fused tricuspid valve inflow pattern was more obvious at this time. You can see it's quite shortened and monophasic. And we also um, uh, demonstrated abnormal and abnormal ductus venosus flow pattern um, with decreased flow during atrial contraction and sometimes reversal of flow. 
um, all sort of um, all along the line of um, demonstrating diastolic dysfunction in the RV reflective of an increased uh, afterload to that right ventricle. So really the only clue on her first echo was that shortened tricuspid valve inflow Doppler pattern demonstrating that sometimes these cardiac findings can actually precede true onset of twin twin transfusion syndrome. And a lot of these observations um, we know about because of papers that were published um, uh, um, earlier, including one um, from uh, Anita Mungrady um, that uh, looked at this diastolic cardiac pathology in monocardiac twin pregnancies, including those that did not have twin twin transfusion syndrome, because of this observation that tricuspid inflow patterns were different if you looked at the donor twin or the recipient twin. And they looked at 112 monochorionic pregnancies, um, 41 of which did not have twin twin transfusion syndrome, 61 who had, uh, who had early stage twin twin, um, and 10 of these uh, twin pairs actually developed twin twin transfusion syndrome after the initial evaluation. So it was a really nice way to see what are the fetal echo markers that can um, predict progression uh, to uh, twin twin transfusion. So as I've been alluding to in this study, what they found was that tricuspid inflow duration was shorter in twin-twin transfusion syndrome. And this was the case even in early stage twin-twin. You can see here in stage one recipients, tricuspid inflow duration is significantly shorter compared to those that do not have twin-twin transfusion. Um, and then the other interesting part about this study was they used a composite panel to assess diastolic function in the recipient twins in which any abnormality in these Doppler patterns, including the tricuspid valve, ductus venosus, inferior vena cava, um, uh, umbilical cord, as well as isovolemic relaxation time was scored as a positive. And using this composite score, they basically showed that um, uh, the, of all the 10 twin pairs that progressed to twin twin transfusion syndrome, um, there was presence of uh, RV diastolic pathology on the initial examination. Um, and if there were no echo findings initially, the twin pairs were unlikely to progress to twin twin transfusion syndrome. So these markers that we look at, functional markers uh, specifically of diastolic function can be very useful in um, determining close interval follow-up and uh, keeping a closer eye on the twin pairs if, if we are concerned. Um, and this has also been showed by other investigators, Rick Michaelfelder um, uh, in the Cincinnati group at the time, looked at myocardial performance index and isovolemic relaxation time in the fetus, primarily the recipient twin uh, in twin twin transfusion syndrome and showed that this the, both of those values were increased across all stages, even in early stage twin twin, again, consistent with primarily diastolic function pathology. So the interpretation of these findings is really that um, filling time abnormalities are present prior to the onset of overt cardiac dysfunction. And the speculation is that these changes are observed um, as manifestations of increased afterload to the fetal heart, primarily due to the presence of these vasoactive mediators that I mentioned earlier. There are also changes in loading conditions with unequal exchange of volume between donor and recipient. And there is a volume load on the recipient that can further contribute to RV dilation and hypertrophy. But the initial findings, sort of these subtle changes in diastolic function seem to be related to these filling time abnormalities. Um, and are consistent with this almost um, uh, hypertensive uh, sort of cardiomyopathy. So in our pre-intervention assessment, um, we recommend uh, fetal echocardiograms for, for all monochorionic pregnancies at risk of twin-twin. Um, one, to uh, rule out structural heart disease, but second, um, we, we may find some subtle changes that can identify pre-stage one monochronic pregnancy to prompt closer monitoring. Um, and we also think that some of these cardiovascular findings are useful um, to assess risk for further progression as well as risk stratification that may help in counseling the family about what to expect. 
I don't really have a whole lot of time to go into some of the other scoring methods for twin twin transfusion syndrome, namely the Cincinnati scoring system, as well as the CHOP score, which have incorporated some of these cardiovascular findings into um, uh, the scoring system in addition to the, the traditional Quintero staging system um, as a way to describe the cardiac changes that are being seen in the recipient and donor twins as well. So finally, I wanna uh, end with talking about um, po our post-intervention assessment um, because clearly in twin-twin transfusion, particularly in the recipient twin, we are seeing some changes, uh, cardiac changes, and um, we have had some interesting studies in the field that have looked at in the era of laser intervention, what, uh, what happens with these cardiac changes over time. And it's reassuring to see that most studies demonstrate that post laser, even um, in this study, they looked at a median of 26 days after the procedure where the fetuses were still in utero, post laser intervention, uh, recipient cardiac findings tend to improve quite significantly, almost to normal levels. Here we're looking at the right ventricular myocardial performance index and the left ventricular myocardial performance index. And you can see there is this improvement um, pretty um, soon after the laser intervention. And similarly, in this more recent study, we are seeing again, using myocardial performance index, a rapid improvement in MPI and a median number of days of uh, about two days after laser intervention, we're seeing a rapid improvement in MPI, both for the right and left ventricle. And then using more advanced image uh, functional modalities that, um, uh, Emilio alluded to, um, like speckle tracking software, um, using uh, methods like strain, <laughs> a group in Los Angeles um, demonstrated improvements in both size and ventricular function for recipients after laser intervention, uh, suggesting evidence of cardiac remodeling. And then um, I briefly discussed the pulmonary, acquired pulmonary valve dysplasia um, and I just really want to quickly mention, I think first, um, we're not seeing this condition as much anymore. And I think it's because we have become better at early diagnosis of twin-twin intervening. Um, so we haven't seen severe cases of pulmonary valve dysplasia as much. We still see it, but not as much as before. Um, and interestingly, if this were to develop in the fetus, um, the outcomes after laser intervention are not as um, sort of a blanket improvement as, as it is for the recipient cardiomyopathy. Um, in this study, um, they looked at uh, a pretty good, decent number of uh, recipient twins who had acquired pulmonary stenosis or pulmonary atresia. Um, and what they found after laser is that about a third regressed, but a third persisted requiring postnatal intervention and a third did not survive. So in these situations where there is a valvular dysplasia, cardiac follow-up is definitely needed uh, because uh, postnatal intervention may be necessary on that valve. Um, and I don't really have time to talk about other valvular dysplasias um, that do occur, um, that both the tricuspid and mitral valves can also be affected in recipient twin cardiomyopathy, um, including the presence of it, our arcade mitral valves. Um, which we do know um, is associated with a poor prognosis in recipient twins. Um, and so just to conclude, I, I wanted to mention, there's been really great studies that have continued to follow these twin pairs over a very long period of time. And I think this is so important um, since we are intervening in utero and changing the natural history of disease, we have to continue these long-term studies to see what happens to these twin pairs. And I think it's very reassuring that most of these studies have demonstrated that 10-year cardiac outcomes really appear to be favorable for both the donor and recipient twins after laser intervention as compared to other intervention strategies like amnioreduction. And these studies really looked at um, you know, so, sort of traditional measures of function, including diastolic function, assessing filling times, as well as systolic function, which all appear to be improved and sustained um, 10 years out uh, from, from uh, birth. 
Um, but I think there's a lot more that we're gonna learn about these twin pairs, including other long-term outcomes related to cardiac remodeling after laser therapy, as well as I think um, understanding fetal origins of disease. There are these interesting reports of abnormal systemic arterial development, particularly in donor twins with uh, changes in arterial distensibility, which I think has implications in terms of uh, earlier onset of adult disease like hypertension, uh, kind of um, going back to the Barker hypothesis or fetal origins of disease hypothesis that these conditions uh, prenatally, although we're intervening and improving mortality and overall morbidities, there may be other outcomes that are affected in the long term in these patients. So with that, um, I want to thank our um, fetal cardiovascular program, as well as our fetal treatment center. Um, and I'm uh, open to take questions. Thank you, Chad. Beautiful talk. And I think I've listened to uh, part of it before, but every time it gets more and more deep and more interesting. I have two questions before we go to the panel. Now, the, um, the obstetricians and, and the fetal maternal specialist um, ask us, do you want to screen all monochorionic twins with fetal echo? Now, mono, it could be mono, mono, mono die, right? From what you've, uh, you've mentioned. So what should we tell them? What are the guidelines? Our, um, the guidelines are that we should um, for all monochorionic pregnancy, whether it's mono, mono or mono die, the, the shared placenta is really the issue here. And um, if, if even if there is no um, uh, suggestion of twin-twin transfusion syndrome, we still recommend a fetal echocardiogram because there is an increased risk of structural congenital heart disease. Um, so it is one of the indica indications for a fetal echocardiogram. So I talk to, I, is it also in their guidelines? The ISOC and whatever, they, they ask for that? Yes. It's it is. part it's of the routine. AI, AIUM guidelines, as well as um, the American Heart Association guidelines and uh, ISUOG. ISUOG says that. Also, I remember many years back, Dr. Huta kept saying about this transmitted um, whatever substances in the, that, that changes the... Um, physiology, and you've, you've shown the hypertrophy. Now, you also talked about mitral and tricuspid. I'm thinking it's a different pathology. I mean, with the pulmonary stenosis or atresia, it's probably, I, I don't know if Anita and Norm would say that as well, is related to the substance that are circulating rather than uh, arcade, which is a structured disease. So it's a different spectrum. So maybe if we catch them early, could we stop that? Is it possible? I mean, I'm talking about pulmonary stenosis at Trisi because you've also meant, shown that after laser, it might and might not. Do you think if we catch them early? I think it's, I, I'm going to let Anita uh, and Norman speak to that as well. But just to say that the theories behind this acquired pulmonary valve dysplasia, like one of the theories that's been out there is that maybe it's a flow related phenomenon that you have this decreased filling in the right ventricle and decreased flow across the pulmonary valve. And so you, you kind of develop this dysplasia and um, poor growth of that pulmonary valve. But that doesn't necessarily explain why not all um, recipient twins who have you know, severe recipient twin cardiomyopathy, then they should all get acquired pulmonary valve stenosis or atresia and they don't. So I do agree with you, there's probably a different pathophysiologic phenomenon behind the acquired valvular disease. And I know Anita, has been working a lot on particularly the mitral valve uh, disease. So maybe Anita, if you wanna um, speak to that. Oh, thank you, thank you, Shab. Norman, you have your hand up, did you? Uh, it's about other things. Oh, oh, okay. Um, yeah, the, the issue of mitral valve disease and tricuspid valve disease uh, is uh, something that we observed years ago in an autopsy. Uh, a series uh, of twin pregnancies that had been lost uh, or terminated. And we had the, the privilege of following these pregnancies as they were developing worse and worse twin twin transfusion. And so we know that the valves were normal uh, and yet at autopsy, they looked identical to a mitral arcade. So I think that this acquired uh, mitral and tricuspid valve dysplasia that mimics an arcade uh, is, is acquired and is probably uh, due to a combination of the vasoactive mediators, some of which are, are pro 
uh, fibrotic and the flow disturbance. Um, I don't know why not all of the patients get uh, these valve dysplasias, as Shab said, uh, but we, this is the topic of an ongoing fetal heart society uh, study where we are looking at stage three and four twins who underwent laser, uh, both to describe the, the uh, incidence and natural history and also to evaluate whether it's reversible with a successful laser procedure. So that should be coming out within the next year, uh, year and a half. Hmm. We were talking about recipient I was going to ask you about uh, mitral arcade, uh, but I think that you you've mentioned it. Have you any idea, Anita, what is other than the uh, the uh, um, uh, chemical mediators? Is there any flow related issues that uh, cause the mitral valve to become abnormal? I mean, it's a very early thing. I mean, arcading is uh, you know the absence of the tendinous cords with direct insertion of the valve into the papillary muscles. So how do you explain this um, on a hemodynamic basis? Um, well, it, it looks identical, as I said. I, I think that there's some fibrosis and, and so forth. If uh, people are interested, this was an article in circulation. The first author was Elizabeth Losada. Um, where we also present the histopathology. So uh, I think that maybe in the interest of time, I won't uh, go, go into all of that, but it, it is a very good question. Um, and then there's also the question of, does the valve, is the valve regurgitant because it's abnormal or is the regurgitation um, contributing to the development of worsening uh, fibrosis? and that is again something that we're hoping to uh, to look into with this fetal heart society study. You're talking about Isn't recipient there, twins, I mean, just to make it make sure we're talking about recipient twin, right? Yeah, so that recipient twin follow, follows the yeah. discussion. Yeah. I yeah. wonder, Anita, what are your thoughts on, you know, it, we've, we've always thought about in recipient twin cardiomyopathy, it's, it's an RV disease because that's where we see the, it's so clearly on our fetal echo, but a lot of studies demonstrate that it's an LV disease as well. We do see changes in filling times in the left ventricle, although we don't see the classic hypertrophy and the systolic function tends to be, that's the last thing to go is the LV. So is it possible that this early changes in filling in the left ventricle contribute to the development of pathology in the mitral valve? Um. That's a great question. I don't know that I have a, a, a great answer. Um, uh, it's something that definitely could be could be studied. Uh, uh, this has been, you know, very frustrating because there are no animal models of twin twin transfusion, and um, and our diagnostic tools have been limited to either ultrasound or um, or postmortem. Uh, or postmortem. Yeah, with the, you know biomarkers are great to measure, but you can't measure biomarkers in a, in a fetus with anhydramnios, uh, and that can't be done without risk e either. And so uh, it's been, been very frustrating, but as the imaging technology is getting better and better and we're getting more and more of these, uh, of these tools, I think we will start to learn uh, more about the, the pathophysiology and, and what's going on with these twins. I like what you say about mimicking arcade. That solves the problem. It's a mimicker. It's not a real arcade, right? Pathology-wise, I feel like a perfect. I, I would. I, I can endorse that, but I would say that our our cardiac pathologist uh, on that paper was absolutely adamant that these were arcades. He he was not uh, willing to say that this was. I arcade like or uh, or a mimicker, um, so I, the jury's out there. Dr. Silverman, yes. So the, so the other question is a philosophical question for Shab. Uh, coming from Philadelphia, you uh, have seen that extensive long list of and of uh, Cincinnati lists of, uh, of 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 all of the various parameters or variables, as Dr. Hoffman would say, uh, um, that, that you can find that are abnormal. 
and uh, working or having worked at UC, you know, this is a very common disease, so it's uh, quite easy to look for this. But for the average person uh, that's probably listening to this, it's not that common to find these things. How much extra um, uh, shtick do you get for your diagnosis by including the, uh, the uh, um, CHOP and uh, Cincinnati criteria on the the criteria of, uh, of um, Quintero, because it seems to me that uh, the guy that really uh, dis, uh, decides on this, the patient is referred to um, the, um, the interventional um, obstetrical uh, uh, person, uh, is the one that usually makes up his mind. And he seems to make up his mind on very simple criteria for doing a laser ablation. And that, that may not be bad anyway. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's it's a good, I have to be careful what I say here since I trained at CHOP and now I'm at UCSF. Oh, no. But um, <laughs> I think that um, it's a really good question. I think, you know, ultimately those scoring systems like the CHOP and the Cincinnati score, I think were really meant to be, you know, descriptive scores that incorporated the cardiac findings in a more routine fashion. Um, into the assessment of monochorionic twins. Some studies that have come out looking at like, for example, the CHOP score and whether it was a good predictor of um, risk stratification or a good predictor of progression haven't really panned out. Um, but in those indiv individual centers, they do use that scoring system to help them determine who is a candidate for intervention. And I will say that we don't use those scoring systems in San Francisco necessarily. We use the Quintero staging, but we do incorporate the cardiac findings in the discussion. And sometimes if the cardiac findings are significant, we may upstage that, that twin pair. So we do incorporate it, but not in a formal scoring system like they do in, in Chopper Cincinnati. Oh. I mean, if you look at the APGAS score, it stood the test of time. The uh, Huter test looks like it stood the test of time, although there, there are problems with it. And the, the thing is that basically um, we're all simple people and we have to make decisions on this. And particularly those of us that perhaps uh, are not, uh, you know, seeing this all the time, it may be uh, much uh, easier for somebody to assimilate five different issues rather than 150. So Shab, what's the difference between the two, if, if I may ask you uh, for the sake of the audience, the, the mm -hmm. CHOP and the Cincinnati, both, both uh, sort of incorporate cardiac function and anatomy. So why do we have two systems? What's the difference? Uh, or are they the same? Are they the I same? I don't know why. They're, I mean, they kind of get to the same concepts. The Cincinnati score actually incorporates their findings within the Quintero staging um, model. So they have these subcategories when there are cardiac changes within the Quintero staging system. Um, so that's kind of nice because it kind of incorporates it into a staging system that everyone's familiar with. The CHOP score is very different um, where it, it, it it's not quite 150 Norman, but it, it's, it's close. I know. But there's <laughs> there's um, several factors, all of all the things that I reviewed the, in the recipient twin and including some Doppler findings in the donor twin are sort of this in this scoring system. And, you know, to be honest, I think sometimes scoring systems are good because it, it, it does um, remind people what to look for in, in when they're doing a fetal echocardiographic assessment of, of monochorionic twins. It kind of reminds you, I need to make sure I get these Doppler patterns. I need to look at tricuspid inflow. What does it mean when I have a monophasic inflow pattern? So sometimes, for purely from a descriptive standpoint, it, they can be helpful. Thank you. Uh, we can look at some of the questions as well here. I'm sure um, um, we have three questions. How do you use, oh no, well, uh, we have this one. No. Uh, <laughs> a selective IGR present with similar cardiac hypertrophy? Not sure what this um, is. Well, Anita's presenting on that next, so I'll let her <laughs> answer okay. that during her talk. Let, let, just one thing I wanted to, to, to ask you if this is the message here. You said something beautiful about early diagnosis of, 
of, of, of this cardiac disease in the recipient, right? So you said that the monophasic filling, if I got this right, is an early marker, according to the research. And, um, and uh, so you don't have an ENA wave, you will have a fused ENA waves. Um, is it uh, uh, in both RV, LV, or it doesn't matter? And is it uh, um, like a, uh, a, an early message of diastolic dysfunction? So the interpretation um, of that. Yeah, the, the, it's yes to both of those questions. The, both the RV and LV filling times in studies have been shown to be abnormal in um, uh, recipient twins. Um, and that is reflected in an increase in the myocardial performance index in both the left ventricle and the right ventricle. There's actually been some really uh, interesting studies where they've you know, shown looking at um, the time course of disease. And I think there was one study that suggested that the LV changes occur even earlier than the RV changes. And that sort of the, is the first thing that's seen this increase in LV myocardial performance index. And then with shifts in um, fetal shunting patterns, because of that, you see, and because the RV carries really the, does most of the work in the fetus, you see more severe disease in the RV. Um, and yes, to the other question you had, these uh, changes are all indicative of uh, early changes of diastolic dysfunction. Thank you so much. I was told to uh, shut up and go to the next speaker. And uh, it's uh, my pleasure to uh, uh, present uh, uh, Professor Anita Mungreti. She's a great supporter of Congenital Heart Academy. And also she is a uh, part of the Fetal Heart Society. Um, Dr. Mungreti uh, is a director of the Fetal Cardiovascular Program at UCSF. And uh, of course, she has a lot of research and uh, awareness uh, uh, projects. And uh, she earned her medical degree from Stanford University, where she also earned the Dean's Award for Research to Human Genetics. She's also a founding member of the steering committee for the International Fetal Cardiac Intervention Registry. And also she is the vice president and board member of the nonprofit Fetal Heart Society and chair of Ultrasound Practice Accreditation Committee for the American Institution of Sound of, of Medicine. Most welcome, uh, Professor Grady. And uh, the title of the talk is Fetal Growth Restriction and Fetal Hearts. Please. Thank you. Um, I'll take a moment to share my screen. Okay. Sorry, I thought I had that set. Okay. Um, well, I uh, definitely have to thank the Congenital uh, Heart Academy and my dear friend and colleague, Rima Vetter, for the invitation to speak today. Um, I'll be concluding our discussion of fetal heart function evaluation by uh, focusing on fetal growth restriction and the fascinating, really fascinating cardiovascular changes that we can observe in these fetuses. I have no financial disclosures. Chosen to focus on this common clinical problem of fetal growth restriction, not because we see a lot of these patients, but uh, because it is so uh, interesting from a cardiovascular standpoint. Um, Fetal growth restriction due to placental hemodynamic compromise uh, it seems uh, sort of in the realm of the obstetrician, but we also have to keep in mind that a variety of other causes of altered growth may modify circulatory development and hemodynamic responses, such as malformations, chromosome aberrations, metabolic disorders, infections, radiation, teratogens, drugs, uh, alcohol, malnutrition. Um, and so that said, the tools for evaluating fetal growth restriction become widely applicable to these other situations as well. And so I hope that you can take some of this information back and, and uh, potentially apply it to other situations. We'll start with definitions, since for the maternal fetal medicine uh, specialist, the small fetus is not really a single entity and the nomenclature can be somewhat overwhelming. Um, growth restriction generally refers to the fetus that's at 
less than 10th percentile, but of course, some of these babies are constitutionally small. Uh, and a good example is those with congenital heart disease tend to be smaller. So I want to concentrate on the fetuses who are small and failing to reach their genetic potential. That is growth restriction associated with a pathologic process that limits fetal growth. What are the etiologies of this type of fetal growth restriction? Well, there are maternal causes such as hypertension, either chronic or pregnancy-induced, cyanotic heart disease in the mother, diabetes, alloimmune disease, protein calorie malnutrition, smoking and other substance abuse, prolonged high altitude exposure, and uh, thrombophilias and hemoglobinopathies, all maternal causes. And then there are placental and umbilical uh, uh, type of causes. We already heard about twin twin transfusion syndrome, so I'm not going to be addressing that. Uh, but placental abnormalities, chronic abruption, previa, abnormal cord insertion, and other anomalies of the cord can, uh, can also give us this picture of, again, uh, limited growth due to maternal and utero placental fetal factors where the fetus is failing to reach its genetic potential. Now, for a long while, there's been a hypothesis that sequential deterioration of arterial and venous Dopplers precede an abnormal biophysical profile score. Fetal surveillance in severe fetal growth restriction then has traditionally relied on the assessment of the central nervous system by non-stress testing and biophysical profile and renal perfusion as uh, monitored by the amniotic fluid index. But these are really end stage uh, uh, problems with um, cardiac output and oxygen delivery. And so we'd like to detect them earlier. And so that's where sequential uh, deterioration in arterial venous and uh, in arterial and venous Dopplers can uh, assist the monitoring of fetuses who are at risk and may precede this abnormalities in uh, neuro and renal function. So cardiovascular physiology definitely altered in these fetuses, but uh, so far I've only really been talking about obstetric monitoring. So let's turn it around and look at these findings through the lens of a fetal cardiologist. One of the uh, first things that uh, can be noted even on a screening obstetric scan or a growth scan is in a fetus with growth restriction, apparent cardiomegaly. So this is one of the most obvious changes. We see uh, abnormal cardiothoracic ratio greater than a third of the chest being occupied by the heart as illustrated in this case of a 30 week uh, IUGR fetus at uh, 500 grams. The issue with this finding is that we're not actually seeing cardiomegaly, which was shown very nicely in a study a few years ago showing uh, in this figure with heart size in red plotted by z-score and gestational age, you see that the heart actually is small for gestational age, but the chest is smaller. If you adjust for not gestational age, but the actual size of the fetus, the heart becomes well in the normal range and it's actually the chest uh, that is small shown in blue. So not particularly useful cardiomegaly. What is useful is, uh, is where it really gets interesting. What we see is a result of deteriorating placental function is redistribution of blood flow. And as oxygen delivery becomes compromised, we see fetal acidosis, declines in cardiac systolic and diastolic function, and a reduction of umbilical venous return compared to the combined cardiac output. So while the waveform of the umbilical artery commonly reflects longstanding changes in the placental circuit, the reduced pulsatility of the middle cerebral artery is interpreted as a fetal response to impaired 
placental perfusion. Doppler recordings of the ductus venosus and umbilical vein reflect instantaneous changes in cardiac function and are commonly added to the assessment to further differentiate circulatory status and determine the timing of delivery. So this battery of, uh, of Dopplers has been shown to be useful in describing the sequence of changes that follow deteriorating placental function prior to 32 weeks. Um, but the pattern is a little less clear after this stage in pregnancy. So by adding Doppler recording of the umbilical vein and ductus venosus, the prediction of fetal acidosis and uterine, intrauterine death can be refined and needle outcome, neonatal outcome better predicted. So let's take a deeper dive into these concepts to see uh, what is it actually that's going on. First, middle cerebral artery Doppler. We know that fetuses that are exposed to hypoxemia because of placental insufficiency display decreasing cerebral resistance with increasing hypoxemia. And studies of fetal blood sampling have demonstrated a significant relationship between fetal hypoxemia and MCA flow patterns. That is, the hypoxemia is correlated with a decrease in pulsatility on MCA Doppler, so-called autoregulation or an increase in net blood flow to the brain in order to maintain oxygen delivery. Here's an example of a fetus of a mother with pregnancy, severe pregnancy induced hypertension and gestational diabetes at 31 weeks. We can see that by BPD, the gestational age is measuring 19. So this is a severely growth restricted fetus and a typical pattern to support brain sparing with decreased pulsatility in the middle cerebral artery, increased pulsatility, and in fact, reversal of flow in, in early diastole in the umbilical artery. So a typical pattern. <clears throat> but it gets more interesting than that. Here's another fetus with an abnormal umbilical artery Doppler. And what's going on here? This is a 25 week fetus who is measuring 21 weeks, we see what we expect, uh, increased pulsatility in the umbilical artery and the MCA Doppler, which I'm not showing is uh, similar to the previous fetus, but there's retrograde flow in the isthmus of the aortic arch. This retrograde flow has been uh, studied and this is a very nice paper from several years ago, looking at changes in the fetal aortic isthmus during increased resistance to umbilical blood flow. The idea here is that the isthmus is a vascular segment between the brain and the placenta that allows equilibrium between those two downstream resistances. And if the brain resistance goes down, that accounts for the reversal of flow. So animal models have shown that increasing placental resistance alone will lead to increase in retrograde flow. And this retrograde flow has been shown in humans to correlate with worse neurologic outcomes at two to four years of life. So a, a relatively late, very severe finding in fetal growth restriction with a very clear hemodynamic um, etiology. Let's move on to the venous Doppler patterns. Now there's a clear association of umbilical venous pulsatility and fetal death in fetal growth restriction, as well as other fetal conditions. There's also association of ductus venosus abnormality with, um, with fetal death or adverse perinatal outcome. And there are associations between inferior vena cava abnormality and poor outcome. So why, why is that? Well, let's look a little bit more closely and I wanna spend some time on this slide at venous pulsations and their physiologic origin. So in general, the severely growth restricted fetus tries to or successfully manages to maintain systolic blood flow velocity in the ductus venosus in the normal ranges in spite of the compromised cardiac function. However, the A wave is commonly augmented in the precordial veins, including the ductus venosus, reflecting altered cardiac performance. There's increased afterload and preload, 
and thus there is increased end diastolic pressure. And this may be aggravated by direct effects of hypoxemia and increased adrenergic drive, all leading to augmented atrial contraction and a pronounced deflection during the A wave in the ductus venosus Doppler recording. The amplification of the A wave is likely to carry the wave further distally in the venous system than is seen in uncompromised fetuses. So the wave is reflecting back, getting to the ductus venosus and may propagate even further back in this situation. Furthermore, the relative caliber of the vessels, the umbilical vein and ductus venosus um, can, uh, there is a narrowing and the relative caliber of the vessel and the acute change in caliber at the ductus venosus, as well as a decrease in net forward flow coming from the placenta serves to further ag exaggerate the negative wave reflection traveling back uh, towards the umbilical vein. Another consequence of uh, deterioration in fetal growth restriction is that there's reduced umbilical flow overall and, umbil and uh, reduced umbilical flow distributed to the fetal liver, which mm -hmm. I don't uh, have time to go into. Um, but this is a major determinant of fetal growth and so may set up a vicious cycle. So within the liver, there's a sparing of the left lobe of the liver that continues to receive oxygenated umbilical blood, but the right lobe is down prioritized uh, and increasingly is receiving uh, deoxygenated portal venous blood. So the increased A wave deflection in the ductus venosus is very well explained by this complex uh, array of, of changes. The venous dopplers are also reflected uh, in the systemic veins, although to less of an extent, there is normally a wave reversal in the inferior vena cava, for instance, and in the hepatic veins. Uh, but there's evidence that the IVC doppler waveforms are also affected. Uh, in fetal growth restriction. And in fact, uh, the degree of atrial uh, or A-wave flow reversal correlates with cord pH and PO2 at birth. It turns out actually that the inferior vena cava is better for prediction of acidemia in the fetus and these ROC curves looking at uh, Inferior vena cava is in circles and whether you express the A wave reversal as a preload index or a percent reverse flow, uh, definitely performing better than ductus venosus in terms of predicting acidemia in the fetus. Although not shown here, the ductus venosus was better for predicting hypoxemia. And finally, as we're looking at heart changes, we can't forget the heart itself because the heart uh, also exhibits autoregulation similar to the brain. So this is a uh, reference diagram showing where one might expect the coronary arteries and a short axis. I'll just stop this. So right coronary artery, left coronary artery and color flow shown in these. Um, one can also uh, put a sample gate over the left main uh, or left anterior descending coronary artery and uh, quantitate the amount of uh, forward flow. And these changes are seen in cases of fetal hypoxemia. In fetal lambs, chronic hypoxia leads to increase in baseline coronary flow and flow reserve is also augmented. It appears to be that, uh, that these changes are due to changes in the actual vessel rather than change in muscle mass or cross-sectional area. And these findings were afterload dependent in this LAM model. It's also been studied in fetuses. Uh, in normal fetuses, coronary blood flow can be seen after 31 weeks gestation um, and still have a relatively good outcome. But in fetal growth restriction, 
coronary blood flow that is seen earlier um, has higher velocities. It's both visible and has higher velocity. And the appearance of the coronary flow at this time in gestation correlates with worsening and fetal status. The interval between visualization of coronary blood flow and stillbirth is variable, but may last between 18 hours and five weeks. However, the very early visualization of coronary artery flow in fetuses who also have ductus venosus abnormalities correlated quite well with poor outcome and fetal death. So the so-called fetal heart sparing effect and its predictive abilities in fetal growth restriction, really quite good. There are additional changes that we see in hemodynamics and fetal growth restriction. Uh, in addition to the changes in umbilical flow to the left lobe of the liver that I already mentioned, we can also see alterations in EA ratios, mitral and uh, tricuspid both. We could see development of tricuspid and mitral regurgitation likely due to the hypoxemia and increases in the Tay index that was so uh, beautifully discussed by my colleague, Dr. Quezada earlier in the hour. There's also a reduction in ejection force and uh, changes in the uterine artery. I just wanna spend one slide on ejection force. This was a paper from uh, 1995 that showed that ventricular ejection force in growth restricted fetuses, of which they had 72, um, was lower than normal in uh, and affected both ventricles, and that this reduction in uh, ventricular ejection force correlated with outcome. They had also 22 of those 72 fetuses had a cord pH measured shortly after the echocardiography and this ejection force correlated well with hypoxemia and acidosis. So uh, a somewhat forgotten uh, method of, of uh, measuring um, ventricular performance, but I think uh, one worth looking into. And then uh, finally, there have been newer modalities. Again, these were mentioned earlier in the hour, but their application to field growth restriction in particular. Um, this is showing strain, strain rate imaging. You can use both Doppler-based as shown here and speckle tracking if you have very high frame rates to show that there is post-systolic shortening seen in over 50% of growth restricted fetuses and that this finding was associated with worse perinatal outcome and uh, higher blood pressure in survivors at six months of age. So more for a research setting, but uh, in the future may become more widely used. And so to summarize then fetal growth restriction and the fetal heart, there is increased resistance in both peripheral and placental vessels and increased afterload on the right ventricle leading to increased wall tension, increased myocardial oxygen demand, and oxygen content and delivery is impaired by impairment of uptake in the diseased placenta. So cerebral autoregulation kicks in, spares the brain, coronary changes reflecting acute on chronic increased flow reserve with a terminal increase in diastolic flow occurs very late. And this persistent hypoxemia overall leads to decreased myocardial function. Finally, venous Doppler abnormalities as a consequence of decreased umbilical flow, acidosis, and altered right ventricular and diastolic pressure occur. And <clears throat> lastly, end organ compromise manifests by oliguria and a lack of CNS reactivity, which brings us back to what our obstetric colleagues are used to uh, measuring in these fetuses. So I hope you found that interesting. I thank you very much for your attention and welcome uh, any questions. Thank you so much. A beautiful talk and a highly advanced, actually. We reached the cream of the cream. Um, um, we have a few questions. Um, Dr. Silverman, anything? I can see that you're raising your hand. No, I'm not raising my hand. Yeah, I saw it below the table. That doesn't of course matter. Did. I'm happy to make a comment. Um, I think, unfortunately, the um, most uh, prolific and important commentator on this um, talk of Anita's uh, is absent. 
and that's Dr. Rudolph, uh, who spent uh, a lot of his life studying the effects of fetal stress. And as one of his students, I saw that the fetus has only a limited number of uh, physiological variables that um, uh, happen when it's stressed, whatever the cause is, whether it's hypoxemia, whether it's uh, uh, hemorrhage, whatever, they, there seems to be that sort of physiological diving response that we know of seals, for example, when they dive, that they, um, their, brain, their blood flow to the uh, non-essential organs like the kidney and the bowel uh, disappear, and only muscle, heart, and brain seem to be increased, uh, as well as adrenal. So um, I think it's interesting to look at this talk in the in the light of, of, of all of these findings. And the other thing that uh, I learned from Dr. Rudolph that I think are interesting, Anita, with uh, regard to the venous flow, is that the um, inferior vena cava, certainly in the lamb fetus, is quite interesting because there one has to think, what is the effect, the effect of the ductus venosus? And, you know, some animals uh, close their ductus venosus before delivery, and some don't have a ductus venosus at all. So <clears throat> maybe um, for the huge brain, the ductus venosus is an important structure. And um, we know for sure that there is a sphincter in the ductus venosus, a definite muscular sphincter that you can see. And um, also that the liver has got a smooth muscle in it, and that if you uh, inject... Um, nor epinephrine into a lamb fetus in the acute phase, you can cause a, a constriction of the liver. And uh, obviously with that, the change of uh, vascular flow within the liver and the ductus. And I'm, I'm just wondering whether some of the um, events that you saw on the, um, the, um, the uh, venous Doppler is related to that. For example, if, uh, we know that, that when the ductus venosus constricts, that you get a higher velocity of um, uh, oxygen-rich blood streamed into the uh, left atrium, and obviously from there to the systemic circulation. And when um, the, um, I've always thought that when you see the venous pulsations in the umbilical vein, uh, that probably what's happened is not only is it related to an increased contraction, but it's related to the fact that the ductus venosus uh, becomes um, um, atonal. And um, maybe one of the effects of the ductus venosus is to prevent pulsation from the, uh, the um, systemic circulation from entering the umbilical circulation. So I just bring these points out um, uh, for your thinking and, and, and comment. But what do you do if you don't have ductus venosus? This theory is not valid. Well, in animals, some animals don't have a ductus venosus and it closes. The pig, for example, I don't think has a ductus venosus and the horse, it closes before birth. And these are uh, words that I have from Dr. Rudolph. So I'm just wondering, well, the human with its large brain, whether there's some uh, issue about uh, how this um, ductus venosus uh, benefits, benefits and is a, a mechanism for preserving uh, some of the cerebral blood flow. So, Anita, do you want to respond to that, yeah. please? I think that, thank you, Norman, that is almost exactly the point that I was trying to make, that uh, we're taught that the ductus venosus A-wave reversal is just due to diastolic cardiac dysfunction, and it's so much... Uh, there's so much more that goes into it. To speak specifically to some of the things that you mentioned, um, the acidosis, I believe, uh, does cause the ductus venosus sphincter to dilate. And so I think that all of a sudden seeing uh, these atrial A-wave pulsations as it's, uh, as it's dilated and now the ductus venosus and the inferior vena cava and the umbilical vein all have the same caliber that the A-wave reflection travels much further back into the vessel. And so you can explain a sudden 
change uh, in uh, the umbilical venous pulsations by saying, well, the, the fetus has become acidotic now and this is affecting the, the ductus spinosus. And we see this in, um, in fetuses who are uh, stressed temporarily, who are undergoing fetal surgery or, uh, or um, fetoscopic surgery for say uh, uh, a cardiac twin, something like that. So it, it can be reversible if the primary cause is addressed and that uh, primary cause of the acidosis is addressed. Um, the, uh, what else did I want, want to say about, uh, well, it, no. oh, uh, the, other, the other point was, was just that, that, um, that the net flow through the vessel also affects it. And so we've seen over and over again, extremely stressed uh, fetuses with um, severe uh, uh, alpha thalassemia and hemoglobin Barts disease, because we're running a, a clinical trial of in utero stem cell therapy for this here at UCSF, we see these fetuses. And um, I'm sure the Southeast Asian uh, where, where uh, these thalassemias are, are a lot more prevalent, are also familiar with this concept that as long as there's a lot of placental blood flow returning to the fetus via the umbilical vein, even um, a very sick fetus will have a normal appearing, uh, I would like to say maybe pseudo-normal ductus venosus Doppler pattern. And that's because there is a tremendous amount of net uh, flow going through the structures. And so the uh, atrial contraction gets masked in that. So the overall is understanding the ductus venosus. We can understand when it's normal, understand why it becomes abnormal and understand that it's not a fixed structure. And you have to think of the other things that are going on. If you see fetal heart sparing at, at 26 weeks gestation, and you don't see uh, a wave reversal in the ductus venosus, that should not falsely reassure you. These other findings are, are quite concerning as well. And, um, and so it shouldn't all just be the ductus venosus. Let me just ask a question here, because in some, I mean, uh, maybe um, you don't have ductus venosus, okay? In many fetuses and they're okay. So if we depend only on the ductus venosus as the, as the sphincter, uh, is this a spectrum of absence? Like you can have, like if we have, if we don't have one coronary, you can have the collaterals. Can we have something like that in utero that will take over if the ductus venosus is not there? Um, certainly, the agenesis of the ductus venosus with intrahepatic continuation is uh, seen quite a bit, um, and these fetuses are usually fine. I would assume that that's because there's some uh, resistance introduced into the circuit by, uh, by having the, the, uh, the umbilical vein uh, venous blood still have to go through the hepatic circulation. Um, and agenesis of the ductus venosus with extra hepatic continuation, of course, it is uh, associated with much more guarded outcomes with volume overload. Um, I think that my reason for wanting to concentrate on the ductus venosus was more as a uh, as using it as a window into what's going on with the hemodynamics and the acid base and status of the fetus and not so much that it is um, performing a, a necessary function, which uh, it may or may not be as Dr. Silverman said, but if it's there, it is useful to use the Doppler patterns, but you have to keep in mind um, that the rest of the heart has to be evaluated as well. Maybe because it's nearer to the right heart. The value of what you said is, is because it's so close to the right heart and the venous side, is it? So, so if, we, mm -hmm. if, we, if we summarize what you said, um, Dr. Mungredi, you're saying that the venous Doppler, if I got it right, is a reflection of acidosis somehow, okay? So the worse the venous Doppler, i.e. the umbilical vein and the ductus venosus, then, then we can say that this is acidosis in the fetus, like a skull pH, whatever. So this is a correlation of stress. Now, this is a reflection of systolic and diastolic dysfunction or what? 
Because once we see the reversal in the doctor's venosis, once we see uh, uh, abnormalities and baby is stressed, is this a global uh, cardiac dysfunction? And we don't get a, a chance to do strain and stuff like that. We just have the, these parameters in IUGR that we're looking at the coronaries, the umbilical vein, umbilical artery, MCA, is this, and we, we don't look at the heart. Is the heart reflecting systolic and diastolic dysfunction at this stage or just diastolic dysfunction? Um, well, again, what I was trying to get across is that it's more complicated than just a, a yes, no answer. Um, so the, the concept of diastolic dysfunction, you know, what is diastolic dysfunction? We see, um, abnormalities in diastolic function parameters when there's simply increased afterload. Um, so in, in a sense, what, what all of those things that you're describing, the brain sparing, heart sparing, abnormal uh, uh, Dopplers and acidosis, these are all reflective of inadequate oxygen delivery to the tissues. And that is reliant on cardiac output and oxygen carrying capacity. So anything that can affect your cardiac output, preload, afterload, contractility, um, that can have an, a downstream effect on your oxygen delivery to the tissues. And that's why you have to assess all of these things um, it, when you're assessing a stressed fetus, including fetal growth restriction. So um, I, I, some, yes, sometimes there is diastolic dysfunction leading to these things. Sometimes diastolic function is normal. Um, or the abnormality in diastolic dysfunction is, uh, is secondary to the decreased oxygen delivery to the myocardium. So it's, it's, a, it's a very complex question and well, a more complex a answer. Yeah. But, but yeah. may I say that in what you're saying that you're trying to tell us, oh, okay, don't look at those parameters alone. Look at as a cardiologist at the heart, assess the heart and look at those parameters. But in IUGR, we don't have a structured heart defect. So in the structured heart defect, we depend on the flows, on the MPIs, on the whatever. Now here we have only those parameters to assess the fetus because the cardiac function is okay and whatever. So I think this is the value of, of, of these measurements that they are the only uh, window to the, to, the, to the heart and to the fetus in general. Do you agree to that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Chap, do you want to comment? You still awake? Um, Are you still there? Yeah, no, I'm still here. Uh, the only comment I'm going to make is, um, you know, related to what you just said, Rima, about, you know, the tools that we have to assess. There has recently been some really interesting uh, studies using cardiac MRI. Um, using both flow and oximetry in the fetal heart. This is from the group in Toronto. Um, and they looked at uh, growth restricted fetuses compared to normal fetuses and found sort of the principles that Anita discussed um, from the fetal lamb models that was um, replicated in these cardiac MRI studies in the human fetus, which was, it was nice to see. But one of the things that I think was interesting about their study is that they demonstrated using oximetry that it is primarily an issue with oxygen delivery to the fetal tissues, but also oxygen consumption was significantly lower in the late gestation growth restricted fetus, which could just be a reflection of the fact that it's a smaller um, fetus, so oxygen consumption is lower. But the authors um, make the argument that perhaps in a state of chronic hypoxia, there is this metabolic adaptation to decrease substrate and oxygen delivery to the fetus, um, which results in oxy decreased oxygen consumption and then continues to slow the rate of fetal growth. So it's sort of this like vicious cycle that continues in, in the growth restricted fetus. So there are other imaging modalities that may give us more insight about the pathophysiology of, of growth restriction. We did not concentrate on the reversal uh, in, the dash, uh, uh, in, the, in the arch, flow reversal in the arch, which is very important, I think. Do, do you want to add anything to that? Difference between that and the, uh, supposedly you've, you've shown beautifully that the arch is wide patent with a reversal. Compare this to, to doctor dependent circulation, how would you differentiate the two part? You do 2D and then you put the color on and see the diameters or one is systolic and one is diastolic. How would you? Anyone would like to comment on the reversal flow in the aortic arch in IUGRs? 
Um, yes, uh, I would say 2D assessment of the arch is, has been shown over and over again to, to be the best predictor of arch obstruction. And so if it looks okay on the 2D, then, um, and we have high resistance in the placenta and low resistance in the brain, then this is the reason for the flow reversal. Um, full stop, you don't need to worry about coarctation. Uh, the problem comes in with these uh, growth restricted fetuses do seem to have a little bit higher incidence of, uh, especially uh, donor twins, uh, small twins in monochorionic uh, pregnancies, they do seem to have a higher incidence of coarctation. And so, um, so you don't wanna have a high false negative rate and in patients where we're not entirely sure uh, and the data is conflicting, then we will observe them after birth for, um, for ductal closure and ensure that that isthmus actually is normal. But uh, bottom line, look at the 2D and then um, incorporate that with, your, with the rest of your assessment. Uh, but uh, uh, dif difficult in the in the small babies for sure. Thank you so much. Uh, any any comments, uh, Dr. Silverman? Dr. Silverman, in the, how's your little the, puppy doing? I just say that it's been a wonderful experience listening to uh, these talks today, and um, I think all the authors need to be congratulated for a marvelous job. Thank you. I think so. I think so. We're Thank so you. grateful. Thank you so much, and uh, to all speakers, to Congen Heart Academy, to Grace, and to our great mentor, Dr. Sutherland, and hopefully we see you again as a group, uh, maybe very soon, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. And Thank just you. to our audience, that the whole thing is recorded, and you can find it on the YouTube under the channel of Congenital Heart Academy. And don't forget to attend the Fetal Heart Society meeting, which is coming very soon. Thank you. Emma, can you hear me? Sure. Thank you. Yes. I'd just like to say thank you so much for um, inviting me and I cannot tell you how amazing the Congenital Heart Academy is. I participate in teaching in Guatemala, which just started a pediatric cardiology fellowship and this is like an invaluable resource for them in learning. So thank you so much for your work with the Congenital Heart Academy. Yeah, we get a lot of thanks from all over the world because fetal cardiology is not a very common field uh, to, to find yeah. and we have great uh, mentors and, and professors with us and uh, Really, we're so grateful to everyone who was spared Thanks. their time to come and teach. Thank you so much and have a good day and have a good night for us. Thank you.